seems to be a trend here. Uh, right back here by Alan and Cindy is Finya. And so she will be with us for a while. And so get to, yeah, get to meet her. So, uh, so yeah. And, and so I, other visitors, thank you for coming our way. Just a reminder, we do have a potluck every Wednesday. Uh, come and eat for free. And then uh, hang around and stay for Bible class. Um, so, Eddie Clore is going to be here on September 4th, and we are going to take a collection up for him uh, 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 on that day. So, just be making plans for that. What we do have is on September the 10th, we have Trey and Lee Morgan coming. I know we've been, you've been hearing about this for the last probably year, year and a half. Well, we're down to, it's getting, it's getting close. It's getting close. And if you haven't already registered, we really need you to go ahead and register for that. Um, also, if you would like to help with children, with, uh, uh, with, with helping with our children and doing some uh, child care, there is a board on the back table back there if you would sign up. Uh, I can promise you, if you sign up, you will not be there all day. We are going to make it where everybody will have a shift. And, and that way you won't be stuck with the children all day. You can come in and listen to, to, to some of the seminar too. Uh, they do have a book out, 10 Ways for a Stronger Marriage. I put one out at Accent Coffee Shop this past week and just kind of wrote in there that this is a free book. If it can help you, if it can help 
uh, your marriage, if you know somebody who can help, take it. It's free. And, and use it. And then I advertise the Trey and Lee uh, seminar. It's coming. I was in an accident yesterday, and that book is gone. So I'll put another one in there. And see if it disappears. But uh, I'm willing, I, I will give away those books as, as, as people need them. I'll give them to them. So, uh, so that'll be then. Also, in conjunction with that, because it is a marriage seminar, and because we're, we're, uh, we're coming to, to, to get our marriages stronger, on Sunday the 11th, which is the Sunday following the seminar, if you would be interested, we could load up, we could go to Texarkana with a couple's date night, go out to dinner, and go watch the new Kendrick Brothers movie. Which, if you're not familiar with Kendrick Brothers, they're the they're the ones that put out Fireproof, Courageous, and all of the good Christian films. They have a new one coming out, and it will be in Texarkana playing that afternoon on the 11th. So, if you're interested in going out and just doing a couple's date night, we'll go down there and go to dinner, and go to a movie together, and just spend some time, and just have some fun. Um, just... Uh, let us know. I'll, I put a, a blurb of it in the, on the Facebook page. Uh, I can put a sign-up sheet if you would like to go. But uh, if you're if you're interested, just let me know because I don't know if we'll go in the van. If we'll just I'll just go down there and uh, and enjoy our evening together. Yes, ma'am. I put a sign-up sheet on the back table. Yes, and I've re and I've removed it. Oh, you did. Yes, because it was for Tim Hawkins. Oh. <laughs> I thought the Christian comedian was going to be there the 11th. The Christian comedian Tim Hawkins will not be in Texarkana until the 18th. So, I'm just saying, we can do two weeks in Texarkana if you want to. All right, let me go down the, uh, the, the ones that we need to remember in our prayers this morning. Uh, we do need to keep Roger, Randy, and Kaylee. Uh, their daughter and her husband Brant in your prayers as they're waiting for tests. Uh, we need to keep Brad Dunn in our in our prayers. Uh, you've had surgery? We're not having it yet. No, I went back up there and I've got two aneurysms, one in each leg. Okay, so no, he has not had it, but now he has two aneurysms. So we need to keep praying for Brad and Karen on that, and and, and pray for some healing and the doctors that are working with him. And patience for Karen. Uh, uh, Charlie, August is to have back surgery soon. Hopefully, is what we're is what we're hoping. Um, also, Nancy Clampett's dad, Joe Whitley, has is at stage four leukemia. So we need to remember him in our prayers and, and that family. And then Sue Crook, which is Chad's grandmother, uh, has some health issues. So we just need to keep them in our prayers too. Are there any others that we uh, didn't make the that didn't make the board this morning? Going once. <laughs> All right. If there are no other announcements, once again, thank you for being here this morning. Let's have a prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this day, and Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us. Father, we thank you for the rain that's on its way, and we thank you in advance for the rain that we will receive. And Father, we pray that as we look to you, we know that you, you always give us what we need. And we th we're thankful. Father, we mentioned several this morning on, on the list that are ill, that are suffering, that, that, that have illness in their families. And I just want to pray, Father, for all those families that we mentioned. I pray for comfort. I pray for strength. I pray for healing. And I pray, Father, you would be with those, those families and let your presence be felt in a very powerful way. Father, I pray for our upcoming seminar. I pray for those who will be traveling here from other states. I pray, Father, that, that as we are all together on that day, that we all will have stronger and more healthy relationships with our spouses because of what Trey Lee will bring to us. Forgive us, Father, when we do fail you and be there to welcome us when we come home. And be with David as he continues leading our praise this morning and be with Rodney, Father, as he speaks your word. And I pray that your words would be his words. Forgive us once again. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> to Canaan, the land I'm on my way, where the soul of man never died. My darkest
particular song, we're going to, we've done this before, we're going to sing the verses of a wonderful Savior, and then we're going to add the chorus to Blessed Assurance. But it goes together and it'll work just really well. So let's sing this together. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. This is my story, this is my song.
church? Amen. Not really what we think of when we think of a beautiful day, but uh, the summer we've had, I'm going to call this a beautiful day. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, we come to you at this time, Lord, asking you to help us humble ourselves. Help us remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. Help us to imagine his body beaten, stabbed, and bloody. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to partake of Jesus' body through this bread. And we pray that you bless it through the nourishment of our body in Christ's name. Amen. Father God, we're also so thankful for the blood that Jesus shed for us. And we're so grateful yet sorry for the pain and agony that he must have went through. But we're thankful, Lord, for that. And we pray that that blood will continue to cleanse us every day. We pray that you bless this fruit of vine and the nourishments of our body. In Christ's name. Father God, we thank you for, for all the blessings you give us each day. We're thankful for our church family. We're thankful for uh, all the people that you put in our lives. We trust, Lord, that everything that you give us and everything that you take away is exactly what we need, Lord. We, uh, we pray now that uh, you will help us give back a portion of what you've given to us, Lord. We pray that you'd help us to do it with a cheerful heart. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You are holy.
song just gets my blood flowing. <laughs> and I appreciate it. Let's stand as we sing this other song, and it's kind of a prayer song. It's about opening my eyes, Lord. Open our heart, opening our eyes. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see So if you would, let's, let's, uh, let's join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that you are, you are our Father. You are the, the creator of, of everything that exists. Uh, you are our source. Uh, you are the one. You tell us to turn to you in times of, of drought, in times of difficulty, uh, when we don't have any place else to turn. And so, Lord, we... We do want to, in faith, thank you beforehand for the rain that we know that you are sending our way. And, and we just pray, Father, that that you would uh, bring rain and break this drought that we've been in. We, we acknowledge uh, our helplessness before you. And, and for so many of us, Lord, it's an inconvenience, but especially, Lord, for our farmers and ranchers, uh, Lord, you know this is this can be devastating for them. So we lift them up to you and thank you for the tremendously important work that they are engaged in. And uh, we just pray, Father, that you would that you would bring the rain. Uh, we trust you, Lord, the the giver of every good and perfect gift. And we just pray this to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, so we are continuing this study of David's life. And, and just to kind of give you a, a little bit of a heads up as to where we're going, we so we're going to, this week and next week, we're going to continue this study. Then we're going to take some time off for the month of September. But at least this is the plan. Now, plans change, right? So take this with somewhat of a grain of salt. But I'm going to tell you, my plan is to have a short series the four Sundays in September. Remember, we are focusing this year on one, uh, particularly 
asking the question, who is your one? Who is the person that you that doesn't know Jesus that you are sharing Jesus with in, in your life? And so we're gonna we're gonna spend some time in the month of September talking about that. But before we get there today, we need to uh, to go to the cave. And uh, I want to begin by saying. One of my favorite songs um, that, that we sing, uh, I think Charlie may have led it on, on Wednesday, this past Wednesday when we had singing, uh, is uh, the If the Skies Above You Are Gray, right? You're Feeling So Blue. Sing and be happy. I love that song. I, that was one of the ones when I used to lead singing a long, long, long time ago. That was one of the ones that I could could sing a little bit, and I love the message of, of that song. But I also recognize that sometimes we sure don't feel like singing and being happy. Uh, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. And, and there's almost this, this um, maybe unspoken a lot of times, but I think a lot of times spoken expectation that as Christians, even when, when times are tough, you just be happy. Come on now. Get it together. Let's, let's be happy. And, and I just want to tell you this morning that that's actually not biblical. Uh, it's, it's, it's not realistic. Or possible. Or possible. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's, it's, as human beings, we cannot possibly always be happy. Uh that's the biblical reality, and it is our reality. Uh, it was David's reality. Let's, uh, let's read this psalm, Psalm 142. And you don't see it uh, up there, but in, in a lot of Bibles, it has a, uh, a, a heading that says that David wrote this when he was in the cave. Let's, let's read his words here. I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him and tell him all my troubles. When I'm overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. Wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. Then I pray to you, O Lord. I say, you are my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. Hear my cry, for I am very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison so I can thank you. The godly will crowd around me, for you are good to me. It does not sound like... If the sky's above your grave, you're feeling so blue. Let's just sing and be happy, does it? Uh, it doesn't really have a happy ending or much of a happy flavor to it. What do you do when you find yourself in the cave? Because if you're a human being, and I think you all are, you do find yourself in the cave at various points in your life. Last week... We saw that, that David's crutches, all of his crutches were kicked out from under him. Uh, it, it, I didn't think about this last week, but it kind of sounded like a country song, right? He, he lost his job. He lost his position. He lost his girl. He lost, he probably if he had a dog, he lost his dog. Uh, he, he lost his self-respect. You name it. And he lost it. It was instead of a rags to riches story, it was a riches to rags story. And yet David continues to trust the Lord. We see here in, uh, in Psalm 142 what he wrote or what was on his heart as he was experiencing this time uh, in the cave. Uh, we saw this last week. And I'm not going to read through it. But David actually pretended to be crazy. Yeah, okay, so he's, he's lost everything, and he goes to the enemy, to Achish, who's the king of Gath, and tries to find refuge with him. And, and um, one, one of the funniest places in Scripture, Achish says to his servants, uh, 
well, you got this crazy guy coming. In. Do I not have enough crazy guys around me? And so the very next verse in chapter 22 is David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. David has gone everywhere he knows to go. And it has been one piece of bad news after another. And so he goes to the cave. Well, the cave, let's think about caves just a little bit. Whether we're talking about literal caves or figurative caves. First off, caves are dark. Uh, if you've ever been, how many of y'all have toured a cave at some point? And, okay, a lot of us have. And, and so what they always do is once you get down in that cave, what do they do? Turn the lights off. And you, that is dark. Okay, that's just about as dark as it gets. There's, there's no light. Uh, caves are dark places. And when you have been to the cave emotionally, you recognize that that is a dark place gloomy place to be. Uh, it is tremendously difficult to see any light at all, to see anything that's good, to see accurately, actually. Again, David is in the cave. I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares. I am all alone. There's nobody to help. It could not get any worse than this. When they turn the lights off in the cave, it is utter blackness. The absence of any light. And you can't see the world realistically, but it feels like this right here is the truth. Now, now, this is actually not true of David and of David's situation even, but it feels that way. And when you are in the cave, you feel dark and desperate and hopeless. You also feel miserable. Uh, Caves are not comfortable places. And I, and I know that, that some of you will say, wait a minute, wait a minute. The, the temperature is, is usually in a cave pretty, pretty even, right? And, and I know we were in, uh, toward a cave up outside of uh, Springfield, Missouri, uh, back in, in the spring. And that, that cave, Majestic Caverns, I think is what the name of it was, it stayed a, 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 an even 60 degree temperature all the time. But not all caves are like that. Sometimes be, there's places where there's heat. Sometimes there's places where it's cool. Oftentimes they're wet. Uh, oftentimes they're smelly. A lot of moisture. And if you try to, to lie down on the, the floor of a cave and, and rest, I'm thinking that's got to be pretty difficult because most of the time they're solid rock. And so it's, it's not a comfortable place to be. And so people who are in the emotional cave experience that as well. It's not a comfortable place. Most people don't want to be in the cave emotionally. Uh, most people don't, don't choose that. But when you're, when you're in the cave, you can't, it, it's almost impossible to motivate yourself to get moving you can't just will yourself to feel better. Uh, you feel like a prisoner. Again, let's look at some of David's words here. I cry. I plead. I pour out my complaints. I'm overwhelmed. My enemies have set traps for me. I am very low. Rescue me from my persecutors for they're too strong for me. Bring me out of this prison. Again, it's, it's not... Um, it's, it's not seeing and be happy. So caves, 
They're dark, they're miserable, and they're also dangerous places. It's easy to get lost in a cave. Uh, it is, um, it's, it's easy. How many adventure stories have we read or movies we've watched over the years where they end up in the cave and there's some kind of rock slide, they get trapped in there. Uh, I remember, I don't know, it's been a few years ago when the, the soccer team, this was over in Thailand, they went into this cave and then the, the rain, uh, it had been raining a lot and then they got trapped in there uh, from the water. And so they're dangerous places. And it's also dangerous to be in the emotional cave as well. Uh, not only is it dark and miserable, but it's a place where we struggle really hard to see anything good. And that's, that's dangerous because it can lead to, to hopelessness. It can, can lead to depression. It can lead to despair. It can lead to us, if, if we're not careful, we can lose our faith. So that's pretty bleak. Uh, again, some of us have spent some time in the cave. And we know what it's like. And it is, it is not a place we want to return to. Some of you may be in the cave right now. Well, the cave is these things, dark, miserable, and dangerous. But caves are also beautiful. And, and maybe we don't, we don't think about this. And I'm not talking about just physical caves. I'm talking about figurative, emotional caves, too. They're beautiful places. Uh, these are some of the pictures that we took inside Majestic Caverns. And, and some of those rock formations, of course, you've got to have light to be able to see it, but absolutely beautiful in there. Uh, that one is, I don't remember what they call it, but it's like twin giants or something like that. And that formed over a long period of time from water and the, the minerals that they, they, they left uh, behind there. And they're tremendously beautiful. These pictures don't do them justice. But how can an emotional cave be beautiful? Well, I think sometimes, and, and again, if you've been through the cave, you know that sometimes that's the place where you experience the presence of the Lord in ways that you never have before. It doesn't always feel good. And, and many times it's absolutely miserable and dark and difficult. But it can also be a place where the Lord is there and it is holy ground. And we learn and we grow and we come through those experiences different than we were before. And so they can be a beautiful place. And listen, where the presence of the Lord is, it is a beautiful place. So caves are beautiful. They're also mysterious. And I think that's actually a good thing in some ways. Um, now, some of us, and I guess myself included, depending on the situation, do not like misery. Or misery. None of us like misery, I hope. Mystery. Some of us don't like mystery. Um, we, we don't like things to be uncertain. We, we, we don't like to not know what's coming around the bend. And, uh, you know, you think about a, a cave, and, and again, the, the adventure, uh, the, part of the adventure is the not knowing, the, the mystery and all that. The reality is experiencing mystery and not knowing what's coming next is not it's not all bad. And so mystery is part of it. Fragile. Caves are also fragile. That's one of the things that stood out to me from, from that uh, the, the uh, experience that we had in, in Missouri. was There's life in that cave that's only found in that cave. And it, you know, it's really important that we not be touching the, the walls and things like that because it would mess up that fragile environment of it. And so the cave emotionally, when we're, when we're in the, the cave, it's a fragile place as well. Uh, we, we recognize, and again, maybe say, well, wait a minute, is that a good thing? Well, I think so. When we recognize our own fragility, that's not a bad thing. Again, we, we see this in David's words. Uh, he, 
he recognizes his own weakness. And, uh, and then in that, he knows that he needs God. And so, so fragility. Finally, caves are places of refuge. So David chose to enter the cave, right? He went there because he's being chased by Saul. And he's gone, you know, all of his crutches have been kicked out from under him. And so he goes to the cave for refuge. And this is not the only time that David's going to be in the cave over the next few years. And so caves can be a place where people run to when they need a place of refuge. And, and I recognize that depression and gloom are not places that we typically think of as places of, of refuge or safety. But they are places where we can gain the proper perspective or a true perspective on life. Uh, think about lament and grief and, and how oftentimes we try to avoid those negative emotions and those negative feelings, right? But lament and grief and sadness, not only are they impossible to not experience, but they are healing for us as well. There are times when we need the refuge of sadness. Again, we're, we're conditioned to believe that, that that's a bad thing. We're told, hey, listen, just grin and bear it. Sing and be happy. But I think it's important that we learn to embrace the cave and trust that the Lord is walking through it with us. Um, we we kind of handle grief, and I, I want to just talk about grief just for a few minutes here. We, we handle grief kind of weird now uh, in, in the modern world. It's, it's almost like we want to hurry up and get it over with and be done with it. Remember, there, back in history, there were times when uh, people were in mourning, and it was an extended period of time. And, and I, I'm not suggesting that we need to go back to you know wearing black for a year if we lose somebody close to us. But what I am suggesting is this whole idea that grief, we're just supposed to just get over it as quickly as possible, is really not such a good thing. Grief is part of what, it's part of the refuge that God has given us for healing and honoring loss in the value of loss in our lives. It's also where we experience peace. And I, I can tell you this kind of on a small scale <coughs> that, that I've been able to experience. So uh, y'all remember last year when we, we lost Brother Bill and I got, got the phone call from Miranda uh, on uh, early in the morning. And of course it was, we knew that he wasn't doing good, but it was still a shock and it hurt. And, and uh, I just, you know, I remember as, as my thoughts go back to that morning, having to, to tell people, uh, especially having to tell my kids uh, about that. And, and uh, it, it was just, it was so tough. And knowing that there was going to be time to, uh, to speak words over him in a few days and that sort of thing. But I'm going to tell you, and, and this was really not something that I planned. It just kind of happened. I, I got, I've just got to give the Lord the credit. I, mean, I was telling a, a, somebody, I might have been George uh, earlier this week. Um, and man, I'm sorry if I've mistaken somebody else for George. Please don't take that as a, <laughs> as an insult. But, uh, <clears throat> but I was able to go and just, sit down in my office back there and go to writing a letter to Bill. And, and I sat there and I would type a little bit and I'd go to cry. And I would type a little bit and I'd cry some more. And I'd type some more and then cry. And trying to type through the tears. And I sat back there probably for two hours and did that. And I, you know, not suggesting that after that two hours that all, all the feelings of sadness and grief were over with because they weren't. They're still not. But I 
felt so much better after that time. And, and so I just think it's important for us to not try to avoid feel, not to not try to avoid the cave and recognize the cave is a place of refuge. It's not where we always want to stay, but it is a place of refuge. All right. So if you're in the cave, we're going to quickly finish up here. Sad, depressed, lonely, mourning. Recognize that first off, the cave is legit. Uh, and what I mean by that is it's not to be avoided. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not something just to hurry and get through. It's not a sign of weakness. It's not somehow proof that my faith is weak or lacking. It's part of being a human being. And Scripture attests to the cave over and over again. Many, this is not the only psalm that's a lament psalm. That's a sad psalm. And then we've got the book of Lamentations, which is all sad songs. And so it is a legitimate place. Remember Jesus in the garden. Right? He was... You could call that a cave experience where he is overwhelmed to the, with, with sorrow to the point of death. It, it, it had to be walked through. It's, it's a legitimate part of being human. I, I love the Psalms because they direct us to, to make our lament, to, to direct our sadness to the Lord. You, you know as well as I do that a lot of time when people are in the caves, they turn to other things for comfort. And a lot of times those other things can't satisfy. In fact, a lot of times those other things are dangerous. And so what we see in Scripture, particularly in the Psalms, particularly here in Psalm 142, is we see David in the cave, but he directs his prayer to the Lord. It, it doesn't run him away from the Lord, it runs him to the Lord. And so may we direct our lament, our sadness to God. Finally, let's recognize that God sends ministers when we're in the cave. And this is a, this is a wonderful thing about the cave. Listen, we were not meant to go through life alone. And, and it's not just about our our physical families. It's also about church family. Uh, look at this here in, in, in uh, 1 Samuel 22. David departed and he goes to the cave. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. These are the same brothers. You know, last time we saw, particularly his oldest brother, they're, they're fussing at David. But when they hear that David is in the cave, they go to him to help him. And, and it wasn't just his family that God sent to him. It's all these other people. And look, at, look at verse 2. Everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. He becomes commander over them, and there were with him about 400 men. And so God brings this motley crew to, to David. And, and I'm sure they ministered to him in the midst of his grief and fear and time in the cave. Now, they weren't perfect. Notice they're distressed, indebted, and bitter in soul. They probably brought some problems along with them too. But God sends ministers. And I think this is a good time to, to point out that when we're the ministers, when, when people are, are in the cave, Oh, by the way, before I jump to that, notice that's an answer. Those ministers are an answer to David's prayer. At the end of Psalm 142, the godly will crowd around me for your good to me. Almost like Jerry was doing a while ago and thanking God before we get the rain. He was thanking God before those ministers got to him. It's like he knew they were coming. But look at this. If we're walking with people through the cave, when someone's broken, don't try to fix them. Because you can't. When someone is hurting, don't attempt to take away their pain. You can't. Instead, love them by walking beside them in the hurt. You can. Because sometimes what people need is simply to know they aren't alone. I, I, I can't help but think about Job's friends. 
They were the best of friends until they started talking. A lot of times, it's not the words that we share with those who are hurting, who are in the cave. It's simply being there with them in the cave. And I just think that's a, a good reminder for us. Uh, you may be in the cave and thinking, well, God hadn't sent me any ministers. First off, if you're part of this church family and you're in the cave, I would suggest to you, God has sent you ministers. Uh, sometimes it's hard for us to see. And, and you know what else? Sometimes it's hard for us to know. A lot of times... We, we somehow, in our, our pride or our whatever it may be, we're afraid to talk to people and share that we're in the cave. Because, you know, what are they going to think about it? We're afraid to show that we're weak. Hey, listen, all of us are weak. All of us. Again, the cave is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of humanity. Don't assume that we know that you're in the cave. Finally, find someone to help if you're in the cave. Find someone to help. And I don't mean by this, find someone to help you. I mean, find someone for you to help. This is one of the greatest ways that we can begin our exit of the cave. I, I love this. David, th this is the third verse of 1 Samuel 22. I mean, right after his parents and, and, and that group, that motley crew get there, David finds a place for his father and mother. He's, he's taking care of them. Uh, a little bit later, uh, one of uh, Ahimelech's sons, Abithar, so Saul kills uh, all of uh, Ahimelech's uh, sons uh, because uh, he helped David. Remember that story? And uh, anyway, Abithar comes to David, finds David, and look at verse 23. Stay with me, don't be afraid, for he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me you shall find safekeeping. One of the best ways, again, for us to begin to come out of the cave is for us to find someone that we can help. And there's always someone that we can help, that we can minister to. Uh, there are other people who are dealing with difficult circumstances also. Well, if you are a Christian, you bear the presence of Jesus Christ. So where you and I go, that the Lord goes with us. And so it, sometimes it, it's not just us walking with somebody through the cave but we are the answer to prayer. We're Christ's presence with those who are in the cave. Wow. Also, if you're a Christian, you know, you know that you have been ministered to tremendously. Listen, the whole gospel is about the fact that we were in a desperate situation. We could not find our way out of the, the cave of sin and death. And Jesus went on a rescue mission for you and me and everyone who would ever walk on this earth. Those of us who know him as Lord and Savior, we've got so much to offer, not in our, ourselves, but because of him and in him. If there's any way that we can minister to you this morning, make it known as we stand together and sing. Let me be free from the world of sin. There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you for evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, there is power, wonder-working power. Oh!